Christians don't have an option. They are going to either implement a Christian worldview or a competing worldview is going to come in and be implemented on them. I'm sick and tired of the homo tyranny. What we need in this country, what we need in the Western, what we need in the world. Forget America, forget the West, forget all this nationalistic uh, uh, prejudices and all this national pride bullcrap. What, what the world needs is a collective law. A collective law, not by some crazy guy in a library with a big mustache. Not some crazy professor in, in, a, in a university somewhere who thinks he's God. What we need is the, the law of God, the virtues of heaven, to become the law of the world. That is the bottom line. Do I believe in Christian world domination? Absolutely. I would be a liar if I said I didn't. Do I believe in Christian supremacy? Absolutely. Do I believe in democracy? Hell no. Do I believe in some sort of a democratic socialist republic? Hell no. I believe in monarchy. I believe in inquisitions. I believe we need to revive the system of the Middle Ages that we had. We had no fag problems. We didn't have a lot of serial killers back in those days. We didn't have freaking drug cartel problems. We had none of that crap. We didn't have no fags asking to be married. None of that garbage. It's homo tyranny. It needs to be destroyed. Christian world domination needs to be established. And uh, homosexuality needs to be uh, deemed as a crime. And uh, the homos need to be told, hey, you got to stop that. If they don't stop that, then I'm sorry. Uh, we have an inquisition, and that inquisition will uh, enact the death penalty, as the scripture tells us. Fascism, the original 20th century totalitarian movement, is really, historically, another name for the, for the political activity of the Catholic right wing. There is no other name for it. Francoism, Salazarism, what happened in Croatia, in Austria, in Bavaria, and so on. The church keeps on trying to apologize for it, can't apologize for it enough. It's the Catholic right, Mussolini. You can't quite say that about Hitler, National Socialism, because that's also based on Nordic and pagan blood myths, uh, leader worship, and so on, though Hitler never repudiated his membership of the church. Um, and prayers were said for him on his birthday every year till the very end, on the orders of the Vatican, and all of these types are well known and the church still hasn't found another in their way to apologize for that enough. And whatever it is, you can call that, you can't call it secular. How can you call a bunch of people you don't even know animals? I call them what the Bible calls them. I just told you. They told me not to use Bible references on this show, but I can give them a reference for everything I say. They're called well, root beasts made to be taken right. and destroyed. I mean, you don't see anything wrong with, for example, picketing the funeral of an AIDS victim? best time in the world to pick at those creatures. That's when they're paying close attention to you. That's dying time is tooth time. They've been living lives based on lies. They died deaths based on lies. It's a cruelty to stand around their dead bodies and preach more lies. Yes, Leviticus 2013 calls for the death penalty for homosexuals. Yes, Romans chapter one, verse 32, the apostle Paul does say, that homosexuals are worthy of death. His words, not mine. And I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Dykes are criminals. Two dykes who are supposedly married, that's not marriage. That's a criminal partnership. That's an agreement made between two criminals. They're just pure criminals. They're rebels. This is a revolution. We're not seeing love. We're not seeing marriage. We're seeing a revolution. But we only have to look oh, as far as today's Iran, for example, to see a classic theocracy, a country from which I've recently returned, where I wondered how to convey sometimes the flavor of what theocracy really is like. Um, well, if you're a woman who gets in trouble with the regime and has committed a capital offense in Iran, you're underage, you're a virgin. You may not be sentenced to death <clears throat> under the law of Iran because the law forbids the execution of virgins. But you may be raped by the Revolutionary Guards so that you're no longer a virgin in the prison and then executed. I think that sort of conveys what people feel they're allowed to do when they think they have God on their side. And I could tell you 
far worse than that, about what the arrogance of power is when it thinks it's backed by, by, by the divine. Well, this arrogation of power in the, in the material world is really nothing compared to the dictatorship that is suggested by those who infer the whole celestial design that backs it. And I know I've taken the counsel. Many have told me this weekend, you be careful. You choose your words carefully. We have presidentials coming down to this conference this weekend. I understand that. But I am not ashamed of the truth of the Word of God. And I'm willing to go to jail for it. Now, my friends, let me introduce to you the next candidate for the office of President of the United States. Folks, please make welcome Senator Ted Cruz. This is an important question. This is, in fact, this is the most important question that I ask any candidate who's running for political office, and that is this. How important is it for the President of the United States to fear God? And what does that mean to you? Any president who doesn't begin every day on his knees isn't fit to be Commander-in-Chief of this country. Amen. Good morning, I'm Dara Brown. There's breaking news at this hour from Orlando where there are reports of a shooting at a nightclub in that city. Oh my God, people are getting shot, dude. Get out of here. Oh my God, dude. firing off shots. Every sodomite's a pedophile. Every single one, you know, it's an unnatural sin. It's unnatural to want to be with someone of the same sex. Today, you know, people say like, well, aren't you sad that 50 sodomites died? Here's the problem with that. It's like the equivalent of asking me, you know, what if you asked me, hey, are you sad that 50 pedophiles were killed today? Um, no, I think that's great. My son was in the nightclub with his boyfriend and other friends. <laughs> And I know that his boyfriend has been shot multiple times and is in the emergency room. But I don't know where my son is. No one can tell me where my son is. If he's been shot, if he's dead, no one knows. But they told me there are fatalities. And you haven't heard from him? You haven't gotten a phone call? We texted him, called him, and he has, he's not answering the phone. But he was sitting right next to his boyfriend, and his boyfriend definitely was shot with multiple gunshots and taken in the ambulance. So the friend, another friend who was in the bathroom at the time said he heard over 100 shots, and it was still active. They, they weren't taking any bodies out of the club because they had a potential bomb in there. So I don't know if he's still in the club, if he's incapacitated, if he's dead or if he's being worked on here at the hospital. The good news is that there's 50 less pedophiles in this world because, you know, these homosexuals are a bunch of disgusting perverts and pedophiles. That's who was a victim here, are a bunch of just disgusting homosexuals at a gay bar, okay? His cousin said Juan came out to his family just this year. I was afraid they might not accept him, but they did. And they embraced his boyfriend as well. He was 22. Christopher Andrew Lee, known, known as Drew, he was uh, Juan's boyfriend. And his mom says he established the Gay Straight Alliance at his high school. He was 32 years old. You know, I think Orlando, Florida is a little safer tonight. Now that 50, you know, the tragedy is that more of them didn't die. I mean, the tragedy is, I'm, 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 I, I'm, I'm kind of upset that he didn't finish the job. America needs time to repent. You say, why don't you call for it? America needs time to repent of their homosexuality, their adultery, and their porn addictions. America's steeped in a destructive form of sexuality. And friends, they're bound for hell. This was a conference about the necessity of the death penalty as a punishment for homosexuality. But part of the way he is campaigning for president, part of the way all three of them are campaigning for president is by attending a kill the gays rally. There were about 65 people inside a bar called the Upstairs Lounge in New Orleans. 
when an arsonist sprayed lighter fluid all over the one wooden stairway leading up to that bar inside that wooden building. They sprayed lighter fluid all the way up the one stairway and then they went back down under the street and rung the buzzer from the street for somebody to open the door. Pulled that door open and the oxygen starved fire burst through like a fireball. A fireball burst through that door and into the bar as if shot from a flamethrower. An updraft sucked the fire in. Within seconds, the walls were aflame and 32 people ended up dying in that firebombing, that arson at the upstairs lounge gay bar in New Orleans in 1973. 32 people were killed in that bar that night, but some of them were never identified, still have never been identified because it wasn't necessarily safe to have your real ID on you if you're going out to a gay bar, after all. In 1996, after he bombed the Summer Olympics in Atlanta and then got away, uh, the Atlanta Olympics bomber Eric Rudolph then started bombing both abortion clinics and also gay bars. There have been five bombs now in seven months there. Suddenly Atlanta's mayor thinks his city might be in the sights of what he calls a deranged killer. We get the latest now from Atlanta and NBC's Bob Dutton. Once again, a bomb in the night. Once again, a second bomb discovered after the first one goes off. It happened outside a lesbian club called The Other Side. Authorities were investigating another bombing at the same club when they found the backpack. The first bomb injured five people, one seriously. Three years later, it was a man named Ronald Edward Gay who opened fire on a gay bar in Roanoke, Virginia. He killed one person and injured six more. He said he was tired of people teasing him for having the last name Gay. And so he attacked the gay bar and killed someone. In 2006, a man wielding a hatchet and a handgun seriously injured three people at a gay bar in New Bedford, Massachusetts. The man, quote, entered the Puzzles Lounge around midnight. He asked the bartender whether it was a gay bar. When the bartender told him it was, the gunman pulled out a hatchet and struck the bartender in the head. Then he struck a man who tried to help the victim. He then pulled a gun out of his pocket and shot the man who had tried to help the first victim. And then he shot a third man across the bar. On New Year's Eve in 2013, another firebombing, eerily similar to that attack 40 years earlier in New Orleans that killed more than 30 people. This time it was at a Seattle gay nightclub in 2013. A man got in on New Year's Eve, poured gasoline into the stairwell, lit it on fire. There were 750 people inside that club at that time. Thankfully this time, fire codes have gone some distance since then. And this time the fire was extinguished and nobody was hurt. I mean, remember, this is a president who refuses to say the words radical Islamic terrorism, just like Hillary Clinton in the Democratic debate. She could not utter the words radical Islamic terrorism. Do you think we should outlaw gay behavior? Well, uh, I think certainly I'm just defensible. asking you, should we outlaw gay behavior? I think that the Supreme Court decision in Lawrence v. Texas, which overturned uh, the sodomy laws in this country, was wrongly decided. I think there would be a place for criminal sanctions against homosexual behavior. So we should outlaw gay behavior? Uh, yes. I believe sincerely within my heart that if you have two dykes or two faggots who have children, those children are in immense amount of danger. They are in danger of being raped, they are in danger of being molested, they are in danger of being assaulted, murdered, killed. And for the good of that child, the state needs to bust open the doors of, of those sodomites and confiscate those children. I really believe that within myself. If I had the power, I would send the SWAT team to all of these, or the National Guard, and I would say, guys, these are the homes that we know for a fact have two fags, and they have a child with them. You go in there, you arrest those two faggots, and you take that child. And the SWAT team would go in there, bust the door open, arrest the two faggots, like terrorists, like the terrorists they are, and save that child from this tyranny, because that's what this is, this is tyranny. That cult of masculinity, uh, that war against modernism, that war against truth, that obsession with apocalyptic violence as a purging agent or cleansing agent, uh, you know, to make the world pure and usher in the utopia. Uh, and I think when you when you look closely at the ideology of the radical Christian right, those uh, so-called Christians in the United States who want to create a Christian state, 
in generic terms, uh, they're fascist. Certainly fascism conjures up historical images as you saw, you know, pictures of Mussolini or Hitler, but it is an ideological belief system. And that's certainly the argument of the book, that this has been a dangerous mutation. These are not traditional evangelicals. They're not traditional fundamentalists who have always called on followers to remove themselves from the contaminants of secular society to shun political power. That evangelical leaders like Billy Graham always talked about not getting too close to power, and he himself was used and burned by Richard Nixon. Mm -hmm. This is a dangerous and radical mutation. It is about creating, in, in, using the iconography and language of Christianity to create an authoritarian, or I think arguably a fascist state. These three American evangelical activists traveled to Uganda and they spoke at that conference and they also participated in a number of follow-up meetings which reportedly included members of the Ugandan parliament. They say gays are born that way and it has been proved, it's been proven that they're born that way. That is a lie. That's what's called a lie. It is not true. There is no definitive scientific study that has ever proved that homosexuality is innate. These American activists traveled to Africa and they urged the Ugandans they met with, including the legislators, to show, quote, zero tolerance for homosexuality. They presented themselves as scientific experts on the subject. They claimed that people can be cured of being gay. Uh, and then they came back home. Seven months later, this bill appeared in the Ugandan parliament, the anti-homosexuality bill of 2009, otherwise known as the Kill the Gays bill. The bill called first for a sentence of life in prison just for being gay. It called for a sentence of death by hanging for the crime of being gay and being HIV positive. You could be sentenced to three years in prison just for knowing somebody was gay and not reporting them to the government. The Kill the Gays bill landed with a thud on the world stage, and almost as soon as it did, the American activists who'd been in Uganda earlier that year urging zero tolerance for homosexuality, they were claiming that they were shocked by this legislation. They had nothing to do with it. Prominent Ugandans who were aware of how that bill came to be were crediting those same Americans for helping with and inspiring the legislation. One prominent Ugandan priest who we spoke with said that members of the Ugandan parliament who were present at that March conference, they left those meetings saying they needed to draft a new law to deal with the homosexuality issue. The Ron Paul campaign has landed the endorsement of a reverend whose beliefs are absolutely jaw-dropping. The Reverend Philip G. Kaiser thinks homosexuals should be executed. But the Paul campaign was thrilled to get Reverend Kaiser's endorsement, putting on their website saying in a press release on Paul's website, we welcome Reverend Kaiser's endorsement and the enlightening statements he makes on how Ron Paul's approach to government is consistent with Christian beliefs. It turns out Reverend Kaiser is in favor of what he calls biblical law, including the execution of homosexuals. He has written about it. As we have seen, he says, while many homosexuals would be executed, the threat of capital punishment can be restorative. A state representative is coming under fire tonight after comments he made on Facebook about same-sex marriage. Republican Andy Gibson from Braxton became the subject of a serious Huffington Post article after he cited a Bible verse that says, quote, gays should be put to death. 16 WABC's Meg Pace joins us now live with more on this controversy from the state capitol, Meg. Well, Darren, since this story broke, Representative Andy Gibson has taken his public profile profile off of Facebook. The Huffington Post grabbed a screenshot of it before the representative took it down. In the post, he cites Leviticus 2013, which reads, if a man has sexual relations with a man as he one does with a woman, both of them have done what is detestable, they are to be put to death. In a statement issued today, Gibson says, I believe this reflects the values of the vast majority of Mississippians and the people whom I represent. Th this movement has tremendous reach within the Republican Party. I mean, I think we could argue it all but controls the Republican Party at this point. We see it with John McCain, who in 2000 called Falwell and Robertson agents of intolerance and is now sort of falling all over himself to court this movement. And there's, there is a tension, uneasy alliance between these corporate interests and uh, this radical movement. Uh, and I think, you know, we should also say, as Robert Paxton points out in his book, Anatomy of Fascism, that fascist movements, they always build alliances with conservative or industrial interests. And, and oftentimes these alliances uh, are, are not seamless. Religion easily has the greatest bullshit story ever told. Think about it. Religion has actually convinced people that there's an invisible man 
living in the sky who watches everything you do every minute of every day and the invisible man has a special list of 10 things he does not want you to do and if you do any of these 10 things he has a special place full of fire and smoke and burning and torture and anguish where he will send you to live and suffer and burn and choke and scream and cry forever and ever till the end of time but he loves you I think we should take 10 million people and 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 flood Washington DC and stop the government if we cannot project that kind of power then we will not be we, we our voice will not be heard because the media belongs to the Antichrist we're at the point now there must be a massive national upheaval if we cannot have it I will predict I'll prophesy to you there will be blood and it'll be massive. Nine members of a Michigan-based Christian militia group have been charged in connection with an alleged plot to spark a war against the federal government. On Monday, the Justice Department said the group, known as the Hootery, planned on killing a law enforcement officer and then bombing the funeral procession. According to the indictment, Hootery members hoped the funeral attack would weaken law enforcement morale ahead of a full-scale uprising against the government. Prosecutors say Hootery members have trained in weaponry and bomb making since at least 2008. Video posted on YouTube shows armed Hootery members conducting military-like training exercises. The individuals in the videos are dressed in full combat gear and carry weapons. In one video, they burn the flag of the United Nations before hoisting their own flag in its place. Part of the group's website reads, quote, Jesus wanted us to be ready to defend ourselves using the sword. Larry Steve McWilliams is the terrorist who went on a shooting spree last weekend in downtown Austin, Texas. And news broke today that, in fact, he's a Christian terrorist. He's part of a Christian identity movement known as the Phineas Priesthood. They're described as, quote, a Christian identity cult originating in the Pacific Northwest that opposes interracial relationships, homosexuality, and excessive taxation. So Raw Story explains, quote, There are no meetings, and membership only entails adopting and acting upon its beliefs, which include murdering gays, interracial couples, and abortion doctors. The beliefs of this terrorist group are laid out in a book called Vigilantes of Christendom which says the following, As the kamikaze is to the Japanese, so the Phineas Priest is to Christendom. So here we have, pretty plainly, a Christian version of Al-Qaeda. Planned Parenthood is blaming the, quote, hateful speech of conservative lawmakers and Republican presidential candidates for provoking Friday's deadly shooting at a Colorado clinic. They released a statement saying, we are grateful for the enormous outpouring of support from people all across the country who are appalled by this act of violence and want to see an end to the hateful rhetoric that fueled it. As regards Planned Parenthood, anyone who has watched this videotape, I dare, Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, to watch these tapes. Watch a fully formed fetus on the table, its heart beating, its legs kicking, while someone says we have to keep it alive to harvest its brain. This is about the character of our nation. And if we will not stand up and force President Obama to veto this bill, shame on us. Well, I think there has been some vicious rhetoric on the left uh, blaming those who are pro-life. Protect babies. There is no... Let's let it all come out. Truth. Because you add the babies that are supposed to be aborted that day, because you add that to the list. Seal the truth, huh? And also... Kill the babies. That's what Planned Parenthood does. It's so typical of the left to immediately begin demonizing a messenger because they don't agree with the message. Watch a fully formed fetus on the table, its heart beating, its legs kicking, while someone says we have to keep it alive to harvest its brain. First of all, do you acknowledge what every fact checker has found that as horrific as that scene is, it was only described on the video by someone who claimed to have seen it. There is not no actual footage of the incident that you just mentioned. 
No, I don't accept that at all. Killing babies in America. That's the subject of this evening's Talking Points memo. For $5,000, Tiller, the baby killer, as some call him, will perform a late-term abortion for just about any reason. You're okay with some woman being depressed, executing her child hours before it's born. There's a lot of evidence there that he was performing illegal late-term abortions and covering up instances of child rape. You should be very disturbed by what continues to happen in Kansas. This man, Dr. George Tiller, known as Tiller the Baby Killer, is performing late-term abortions without defining the specific medical reasons why. Dr. George Tiller, who is uh, one of the few doctors in the United States who performs the Hitlerian procedure known as uh, a partial birth abortion. Right. Tiller has killed thousands, thousands of late-term fetuses without explanation. No question, Dr. Tiller has blood on his hands. Tiller, the baby killer out in Kansas, acquitted. Acquitted today of uh, murdering babies. There's got to be a special place in hell for this guy. This guy will kill your uh, baby uh, for $5,000, any reason. Any reason. You go in, you go, the Glenn Beck program upset me today and I can't have the baby. <laughs> I mean, bang, I, you got five grand, I'm he's sure. taking them out. The new details in our breaking news here on CNN, the slaying of a controversial abortion provider, George Tiller in Kansas, in broad daylight inside his own church. We are hearing from police at this hour, wrapping up a news conference just a short time ago. And at the scene, a church of all places, investigators are combing the lobby and talking to witnesses for clues. You made your mind up on the 24th when you sat in that church that you were going to kill Dr. Tiller? Yes. The lives of those children were in imminent danger. If, if, if someone did not stop George Tiller, he was going to continue, as he had done for 36 years prior to that time. If, if someone did not stop him, they were going to continue to die. The babies were going to continue to die. Roe versus Wade was uh, put through the, uh, the Supreme Court in 1973. We've murdered 57 million babies since then. Now, my friends, we are not in a season of decline. My, I argue to you that judgment is coming. We, if we, in, a, in another couple of years, if this doesn't stop, we will hit 60 million abortions. If we hit 60 million abortions, we, will, we as Americans will have murdered 10 times more human beings than the number of Jews murdered by the Nazis. Uh, a clinic escort who was uh, working in the South, a man named James Barrett, retired as a lieutenant colonel from the U.S. Army. He was shot to death in Pensacola, Florida, outside a clinic there, as he was trying to escort the clinic's doctor into that facility past a big group of anti-abortion protesters. Both the doctor, Dr. John Britton, and the man who was working to try to escort him into that clinic, that retired colonel, James Barrett, both of them were killed and others were wounded in that shooting. Then six months later, a young man named John Salvi uh, shot seven people at two abortion clinics in Brookline, Massachusetts. He killed two of the people he shot. He wounded five others. Some of the people who were witnesses to that shooting were people who were there at the clinic working as clinic escorts because of the hostile and intimidating and occasionally violent, intense protests that had been happening regularly outside of those clinics. That day when John Salvi went into those two clinics in Brookline and opened fire and he shot all those people, there were anti-abortion protesters right outside the clinic when he did it. The two offers are, um, at that point, as you will know, at least from all the, two, two of the leading monotheisms, either an eternity of praise and servility, everlasting praise and adoration of someone who has only done his job by creating you, hasn't been invited to do so, proposition that sounded more like hell to me when I first heard about it, or a very much more unpleasant one, derived not from the Old Testament but from the New, there's no hell in the Old Testament. There's genocide, there's racism, there's slavery, there's child mutilation, there's all, everything else you could wish for, but there's no punishment of the dead. Not until the, the arrival of the gentle Nazarene is it suggested that for a crime you probably were forced to commit, because after all you're created a sinner, you're created sick and commanded to be well, the essence of the totalitarian principle. Uh, but for that, you might face an eternity of torture, for, to which there will be no end. Now, I think this is a horrible proposition. I think those who wish for it are wishing for slavery and civility, for the abdication of their own responsibility, for the dissolution of their minds, the abolition of their individuality. I'm therefore very glad to say that there is no evidence for it at all. If there was a supervising creator 
who took a personal interest in your life. What you would have from the moment of your conception, in one, at least in one interpretation, would be a permanent, inescapable, unchangeable, unalterable, unchallengeable rule, which would involve round-the-clock surveillance and supervision of every single waking and sleeping moment of your life. The abolition of any privacy in your life or even in your mind and your most private thoughts. The most complete form of totalitarianism ever imagined.